Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Today's episode is brought to you by my new book, You're a Leader, Now What? The Proven Path to High Performance Leadership. The book contains many of the great lessons that we've been learning together during the Leadership Project podcast, together with many other lessons that I've collected over my 30-year career as a leader. The book is aimed at first-time leaders, but really there's lessons in there for everyone. It would be greatly appreciated if you could go and grab your copy on Amazon as either an ebook or a paperback, and if you could leave us an honest review on Amazon. Now, on with the show. Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by Ian Ziskin. Ian is the president of the Exec Excel Group, LLC. We're going to talk a few of the things that he does beyond that. He's heavily involved in a consortium for change, and we'll talk a number of different things that he does. But he is a business and human resource leader with 40 years experience. He's been a board advisor. He's been a coach, a consultant, an entrepreneur, a teacher, a speaker, an author. And ultimately, he's also the author of a book called the secret source for leading transformational change, which will be the key topic that we do here. I feel like I could talk for the entire podcast and still be introducing Ian with all of his accomplishments in multinational companies and his rich history, but I'm sure you would prefer to hear from him. So Ian, please do say hello to our audience. Tell us a little bit more about that rich background and what led you to be with us today. Nick, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. As you mentioned, I've been in the human resources and leadership game in one way or another now for about 40 years. Loved my corporate career, learned a ton, uh, moved all over the United States, traveled all over the world, and uh, probably made every mistake uh, in the book you could make and hopefully learned a few things from the mistakes as well as the random successes. Uh, And as much as I loved my corporate career, I also had this entrepreneurial gene in me, I guess you could say. And about 12 years ago, launched my own coaching and consulting firm called Exec Excel Group, as you mentioned, which is a combination of coaching senior leaders, quite a bit of leadership development work, and a lot of advisory roles sitting on boards of directors or advisory boards or playing senior advisor roles with a variety of organizations, typically much more entrepreneurial than the larger corporate kind of organizations that I experienced earlier in my career. So I hope that the advice that I offer to these smaller, more entrepreneurial companies is valuable, but I always find that I get 10 times more back in what I learn from spending time with and hanging out with other entrepreneurs who've taught me a lot about how to get things done quickly and without bureaucracy and quite often without the resources that are really needed to uh, get the job done. Hopefully it's made me a better business person as well. That's a little bit about me. Yeah, brilliant, Ian. And first of all, congratulations on your success. A 40-year career clearly shows that you've got a a passion for it. And it clearly shows with the success that you've had, that you're very good at it. What I love that I picked up there is that here you are as a 40 year veteran in the industry, and you're still learning from your clients and you're still got that learning mindset where you're out there. Yes, you're helping others. You're helping others transform their businesses. You're bringing lessons from multinational companies through to smaller, more entrepreneurial and nimble companies and, and vice versa. But, but you're you're learning every day. What makes that learning mindset important, do you believe? Well, I think primarily 
uh, you have to start from a place of a certain amount of humility that you don't have all the answers. Uh, one of the things I've loved the most about my career, both the corporate side as well as the uh, entrepreneurial side running my own business, is how many things that I've been exposed to where I didn't necessarily feel that I was ready for the things that I was being asked to do or that I was going to encounter. So what's highly motivating to me is being thrown into or throwing myself into challenges where you don't necessarily know whether you have all the experience or background or skill set to be successful and, and testing and challenging yourself that way. That's maybe uh, you know the, the underpinning of my whole uh, mindset around this. And of course, the other thing is that the more interesting people you surround yourself with, I think the better you become, you know, both as a human being and perhaps as a leader or a business person. So I've always tried to associate myself with people who were not all exactly like me, having grown up the same way or the same places that I have, and just try to make myself better by surrounding myself with lots of other really good people who are quite often better than me or know a lot more than I do about certain things. And I, I think I have to believe that that's made me uh, you know, better and, and more effective. It certainly made me uh, you know, richer for having the experience intellectually and experientially of being around these kind of folks. That's just always been very important to me. There's three really key things I'm picking up there, Ian. The first one you said about humility. I think that's a really key message for all of us. It is very hard to learn anything new if you think you already know everything, right? So, so keeping that open mind and that humility, that's wonderful. I love this thought around challenging yourself, right? So you always, it sounds like the picture I was getting was an Ian that was seeing a new opportunity that would push yourself, maybe push yourself out of your comfort zone into, into something new. And then the third one, there was two elements for it. One was building that network around you. But what I heard was building a network around you of diverse opinions and people that are not the same of you. If you just surround yourself with five people that look, breathe, smell, taste like you do, you're not going to learn much. But, but if you find those gems where you go, oh, you're interesting, I've never heard of that before, and you draw that person close, then you can get into that learning. Tell me more about either of those. I'll give you the choice uh, about this challenging yourself and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone or this diversity and picking those people that are not quite like you. Well, this, this may be cheating, but I actually see a direct connection between those things. Because, you know, if you're the type of person who surrounds yourself with diverse thinking and perspectives and kinds of people, inevitably that will lead to you being uh, challenged by new and different ideas and different ways of thinking about things. I, you know, we're all human, including me. I mean, sometimes it can be frustrating or you get impatient, as, as I sometimes do, with people pushing back or questioning or challenging certain things. But if you allow yourself to step back from that for a moment and realize that you'll end up with a better product or better idea or better implementation of what is whatever it might be that you're trying to get accomplished because people are asking tough questions and they're looking at things from a very different angle than you are, that actually helps with the, the challenge of learning new things because you're also being constantly challenged by other people who are around you. And that starts with my own family, uh, but has, you know, extended, you know, well beyond that to friends and, and colleagues and clients and lots of other folks that I've worked with or, or grown up around over the course of my life. And, you know, e even as we get into, um, you know, talking a little bit about the book, during our conversation, that's actually one of the most important things that jumped out at me from even the experience of, of writing that book was the value of having diverse points of view, 
and many different voices contributing to a topic. In this case, leading transformational change, but I think it applies equally well to just about any other subject that you might uh, be focusing on as an individual or uh, as a leader in an organization. Yeah, brilliant. And I love that you're bringing that even in your family situation, not just in the business world. And the world is all about perspectives, right? You have your perspective, you're looking at a problem from one angle, but if you want to see the whole of the problem and you want to see the whole of the situation, you need to be able to see through other lenses. And one of the greatest ways to do that is to surround yourself with people that have those other lenses and have those other perspectives. And then you are all richer, yeah? I think that's right. And, uh, you know, I'm just a side note from a personal standpoint, kind of living through that right now. I have three sons and my my middle son, uh, his wife, our daughter-in-law, is from Sweden. And uh, they currently live in, in Los Angeles in the United States. But uh, at the end of July, they're going to be moving uh, with our two uh, granddaughters back to Sweden, where my daughter-in-law is originally from. And so, you know, they will be going through this entire, you know, reacculturation. My son uh, obviously will have a lot more to learn than my daughter-in-law about what it means to live in Sweden. But even the rest of us as a family and, and as a family unit, you know, are all going through the, the process of understanding the similarities and differences, and there are both, uh, between, you know, Swedish culture and American culture and what life is like, you know, living someplace uh, you know, else outside the United States, and we're all better for it. And, and our, our granddaughters, I think, will end up becoming uh, much better for it as well, because they'll be essentially growing up in a bicultural existence. And that's something I find very uh, exciting and enriching. What a wonderful experience for all of them. I, I don't know them, and I'm already excited for them. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. I've got one more uh, lead up question before we get to the book that I'd love to ask you. Someone 40 years experience in HR. In fact, there's probably two here. What are the biggest changes that you've seen in HR practice in that time? And I think we could spend probably seven hours talking about that, but pick maybe one or two really key shifts that you've seen in HR thinking in, in that 40 year period. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the two that I've seen kind of live through myself, but also lots of other folks uh, who I'm surrounded by dealing with these. Uh, you know, I think the first one is just about every challenge uh, an HR person is faced with these days is multidisciplinary and cross-functional in nature. You know, all the, the problems that we're being asked to address are big, they're hairy, they're complex, they're very long term, uh, and almost none of them can be solved anymore by a purely HR specific set of skills or ways of thinking about the problem. So my, my analogy for this, I talk a little bit about this uh, in, in some of the leadership programs that I do, is this concept of uh, HR as an orchestra conductor, where you think about uh, an orchestra conductor is not an expert on playing the flute, uh, the timpani, or any other instrument that you would find in an orchestra. Their job is to find the very best musicians in the world in their particular area of expertise, uh, bring them together and orchestrate uh, your know, beautiful music I think there's actually a pretty tight connection between that and what you're going to see. And we already are seeing uh, HR people being more comfortable with, or at least needing to be more comfortable with as they solve problems, because most of the problems are going to require uh, input, engagement, involvement, collaboration, partnership with people well outside of the HR function. And in some cases outside of the comfort zone, or certainly the expertise of HR leaders, yet HR is by far and away the best function to be orchestrating those uh, cross-functional multidisciplinary solutions. So that's really the first big change that I've been seeing for many years, and I think it's going to continue to accelerate. The other one has to do with analytics and data relying on uh, you know, a much higher degree of precision 
and insight into solving problems through analysis and justifying the actions and the investment that needs to be taken by HR people through uh, good analytics and the insight that comes from analytics. And I, I just want to clarify one point. Sometimes when we talk about analytics, uh, what first comes to people's mind, you know, is a dashboard with multiple colors on it. And the organization is measuring 35 things at the same time, but having no insight at all into what are the most important metrics or trends, and then what do we do about it, most importantly. So my way of thinking about analytics is, you know, you might measure 35 things, but it's probably true that only three, four, or five of them really matter uh, in terms of the business winning and being successful and sorting out what are those three or four or five things that are most important that the organization needs to get its arms around in terms of data and then insight and then taking action on those insights. That's a capability that a lot of HR people don't yet have, have been slow, frankly, to pick up. Uh, and uh, the better progress that we make, as much as I love the, the HR profession and people in it, the better progress we make at that, the higher the likelihood it is will be seen as ready for and relevant to the changing nature of work and the workforce and the workplace. At least that's how I've seen it evolve over the course of the last uh, 10 years. And I think we're just, we're just scratching the surface. There's a lot more to come. I think there's a lot there for us to stop and reflect on there, Ian, all of us out there, that can be a call to action today. Think about the measures that you are collecting in your company and do you even remember why you were collecting them, right? Are they the right ones? Were, were you collecting them for the right reason? And then what is it telling you, right? And I agree with you, Ian. There's probably only three to five of them that are really critical indicators and the rest people are doing it because they were told to do it or seemed good at the, at the time but no one remembers why now and yeah, all kinds of reasons, really good. And, and I love that analogy of the orchestra, surrounding yourself with people that have skill sets and that complement yours, ones that you don't have, complement your weak points, but then creating an environment where those people can excel at their craft and then being the synergist who can then get all of the parts of that orchestra in tune and working together in harmony. I think there's, there's definitely something there for all of us as well. Well, you can either be intimidated by that or you can be energized by it. Sorry to interrupt, but I think, I think some HR people are maybe, with all due respect to you know, all of my colleagues in HR, a, a little bit intimidated by the idea you know, of, of playing that role as the, the integrator and the orchestrator across functions. But the very best uh, HR people that I spend my time with are extremely energized by that role and, and the possibilities that that creates. And, you know, for somebody like me, who's been doing this for 40 years, you know, those are the reasons why I get up, you know, and I'm still energized and excited about being associated with the profession. It's for those kinds of opportunities that we've been uh, building toward and working toward for uh, many years. And it's, it's beginning to happen now. It's very exciting. I can see that straight away. I've got to say, Ian, uh, for those that are listening to the podcast on the audio and not seeing this on the video, Ian's face lit up when he actually said, I get energized by that. So I can tell that that's a true passion there for sure. Love to get onto the books. So you've written or co co edited four books, but the one I want to talk about most today is The Secret Source for Leading Transformational Change. Let's start with what led you to write the book in the first place. Yeah, a combination of a couple of things really led me to write the book or become the lead author for it. First one, we've all experienced in one way or another, which is the last couple of years of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, sitting around uh, reflecting a lot on what was going on in the world around me, but also around the rest of us, you know, started, of course, with all of the, the health related challenges and uncertainties and people getting sick and, and people dying, you know, just a horrible kind of circumstance, 
also then ex- expanding from that to economic uncertainty and a lot of organizations wrestling with almost overnight moving toward remote work and attempting to figure out whether it could actually be done. Same thing with schools. A lot of schools around the world were operating remotely during the pandemic. And uh, even, you know, political divisions, you know, certainly in the United States, and I think a lot of other countries as well, where everybody has their own strong feelings about a whole variety of different issues. And uh, led me to think a lot about circumstances of significant transformational change how do you survive and then ultimately thrive when you're going through those kinds of big changes? So that was really the first impetus for the book. Uh, The second one was, um, as you alluded to a little bit earlier in the introduction, I lead this consortium called the Consortium for Change, which has now about 75 independent coaches and consultants, many of whom are themselves very passionate about and knowledgeable about the topic of leading transformational change. And we decided that we wanted to collaborate on putting this book together and do it in a way, we hoped, where we would introduce a wide variety of lenses, lots of diverse thinking and ideas quite a few voices in the book, both from the consortium as well as other people in in my network who have a lot of knowledge and experience in transformational change. So I've grown to be fond of the the description of uh, 200 voices in under 200 pages, because one of the things we learned uh, talking to our publisher, but also lots of other consumers of books is, you know, many people don't read books anymore. Uh, And certainly the 350 or 400 page variety uh, is a little tougher for people to get through. So we've tried to pull together as as many ideas and lenses and voices related to leading transformational change as we could, but do it in as brief and practical and pragmatic way as we also could so that we can put some tools uh, and ideas in people's hands that they can then use, you know, back in their lives, because the the change that we're looking at is at the individual level, the team level, uh, the organizational level, but it also has uh, lots of implications at the societal level as well. Uh, and that's really why we got started on this project. Yeah, well done. And it is a changing world where, uh, yeah, maybe people don't read books as, as deeply as once they may have done. It's a fast-paced world where sometimes we live in a three-second world, right? So uh, Instagram reels and all kind of TikTok, all, the, all of these kind of things, but there's still a need for the message to get out there. So I like the, the fact that you brought together some diverse voices, but you also thought about what is going to be the best way to get this message out there to an audience. Yeah, really good. I want to step backward for a second about the pandemic because it was one of the things that led you to writing the book. Can I ask you, how did your own perspective of the world change during the pandemic? I mean, Ian Ziskin, how did your individual perspective of the world change during the pandemic? Yeah, it, it changed uh, a lot, uh, actually, in, in a couple of ways in particular. One was the recognition that anything and everything can change literally overnight. The second one, second perspective for me personally was the reminder that we don't really control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond to it, which is something that I've, you know, I've always known and I, we talk about it in the book as well. So it's not a new idea. But until you live through something like a, a pandemic and watch its impact on everyone, including yourself, it, it's, a, it's probably a healthy reminder in a very difficult situation to recognize that you don't control everything that happens, but you do have some influence, a lot of influence on on how you respond to it. So for me, I tried to, you know, take as many positives out of, you know, two years being, you know, locked in your house 
uh, as I possibly could and, uh, you know, come out the other end a better person for it. And um, I also found myself thinking, uh, leading up to the pandemic, I wasn't certainly smart enough to see COVID coming, but I, I was working diligently for a couple of years prior, trying to continue doing what I love doing, but travel less while doing it. And then, of course, suddenly, uh, in that sense, COVID was a bit of a gift because uh, you know travel was uh, significantly curtailed over the last couple of years, but still being able to run my business mostly virtually uh, and continue loving what I do and, and working with the people that I enjoy being with uh, without necessarily having to get on airplanes to do all of it uh, actually was a positive that came out of a very negative circumstance. So those are the probably the most significant things that affected me. And I, I was very lucky on, on a personal level. I recognize many other people were not so lucky. I uh, really didn't have any close relatives or friends who passed away as a result of COVID, but certainly did know, you know, other people who had, you know, much more uh, horrific experiences uh, with family and friends of people dying uh, unexpectedly uh, and consider myself quite fortunate for having, you know, a- avoided most of that heartache. Yeah, and me too, I have to say, but my thoughts are, or our thoughts, I should say, are with everyone that was affected. There's many families out there. It impacted all of us in some way, but clearly some families were more directly impacted than others, and our thoughts are with them. Uh, What did you learn about the world and about the workforce during that time? Well, about the world, I think I learned that, you know, we, we have a tendency to focus on differences, you know, from one country to another, one culture to another. There are differences, of course, but uh, I'm a firm believer that we're more alike than we are different uh, as human beings. Uh, And you can certainly see how the economy of the, the world is very tightly knitted together And so when you have a global pandemic that also has global implications for the economy and the supply chain and all the rest, you you learn a lot about the fact that we're all highly dependent on one another. And mostly that's a positive. I have to admit, you know, as as a fellow human being, I also have been disappointed by how some people have, I'll call it, gone the selfish route you know, of worrying more about themselves than about others. So you really never know how people are going to operate under stress. Most people, I think, pleasantly surprise you. And and certainly, I don't know if I was surprised, but I was very pleased to see how a lot of people, you know, stepped up and did the right thing and try to help other people and, and you know, do what's best for the, the larger uh, community. But admittedly disappointed that, you know, not everyone does that. Uh, And so, uh, you know, you learn a little bit about how people handle stress when they're under stress and not all of it is positive. Yeah, there there was all kinds of things for for me, if I can play back to you. I think I'm feeling that we we learned similar things. I was disappointed to see things like racism really come to the fore uh, around and, and blaming each other. You know, this is all the problem of a certain race and all of these things. I was disappointed with that. I was disappointed with the dog-eat-dog world of uh, seeing shopping centres where there was no toilet paper left because everyone got into a panic and just cleared out all the toilet paper. So there were some bad parts of humanity that came through. The social media one was interesting because that was both positive and negative. The toilet paper thing comes because you know, algorithms you know, spit out, oh, the world's going to run out of toilet paper, so everyone panics. So there's a negative, but there was also a positive around social media. And then I think the big positive was I think we proved that we're a bit more resilient than we thought we were, that we're stronger than what we think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say exactly the same thing. The, the, the resilience that came through was very encouraging to me, both, you know, on a personal level, I mean, individuals being resilient, but organizations and societies also being resilient, you know, when they were at their best. The whole hybrid 
work or remote work movement. I think it's been a good example of that. You know, for somebody like myself, who for the last, you know, eight, nine, 10 years has been looking at a lot of trends around the future of work and HR, this whole idea of people working more remotely is not brand new, but it was, you know, much more in its infancy much more experimental organizations piloting it on small scales, a lot of senior level leaders, a lot of CEOs, you know, being highly resistant to it, you know, for a variety of reasons. And then literally overnight, having to figure out how to implement getting work done remotely in a lot of cases, not all obviously, in order to survive. And look what's been achieved over the course of a couple of years. And now, of course, companies are trying to figure out where they individually want to be on the spectrum of hybrid work and you know, how much we want to bring people back to the office versus continue to encourage people working from home or other remote locations. Obviously, there are all kinds of jobs that are being done in the world that don't lend themselves to remote work. And many of those people were coming into work every single day. Uh, in hospitals or manufacturing plants, and the list goes on and on, uh, where they didn't have the option of of not um, coming into a physical location to work. But we will figure it out over the coming years, uh, and we'll be better for it because it's forced us to recognize that a much higher degree of flexibility is required in dealing with our workforce if we want to still remain attractive as employers, because people have options and alternatives, and increasingly they're exercising those options uh, and doing it without guilt uh, by saying they want to have some sense of balance between you know how and where they work uh, and how they run their personal lives. That's as it should be, in my humble opinion. But organizations are being forced now to reckon with that, which they've, uh, in many cases, worked hard to ignore or avoid for a very long time. Yeah, there's been a big awakening there, right? And we see the great resignation, the great realisation, whatever you want to call it, the great protest. But what it was, was people stopping and going, well, hang on a second, there is a different way of doing things. And I want to find a workplace where I do have purpose and meaning, where I do I am able to work the way I would like to work and still be a productive member of the workforce, etc., so whatever the answer is going to be at the end of the Great Resignation, because we're far from the end of that, people, it's a revolving door right now where people are out there, out there searching. But it did stop, it got people to stop and reflect and go, hang on a second, am I truly happy in what I'm doing? And, you know, you could also say there's a negative side of that, that it tested people's loyalties and whether loyalty was a two-way street or a one-way street and all kinds of things. But it did make us stop and and rethink about the future of the workplace, right? So, yeah, very, very interesting. Well, if you think about it in the context of, of, you know, your audience, people not only in HR, but also business leaders and people who aspire to be leaders, this will turn out to be, I think, one of the most differentiating capabilities that leaders of all kinds will need to master and get comfortable with And that is, uh, how do I lead a group of people when we're not all physically in the same space? How do I trust people enough to believe in them when I can't see them every moment of every day to recognize, uh, you know, that they're quote unquote working and the measures of productivity and output and and capability uh, are all going to be different because, Uh, Much of the work is going to be done when people are not physically in the same place. The leaders who struggle with that will not be very effective leaders or may not be leaders for very much longer. The leaders who pick up on that and are comfortable with it and capable, uh, I think are going to be the leaders who distinguish themselves going forward. The ones that can adapt to this new world quickly, the ones that see it as an opportunity rather than an adversity, things like this. I, I think you're spot on there, Ian. I want to also give a nod to what you said that not all of us were lucky in that regard. So you and I are lucky. We can do our work from anywhere in the world as long as we've got a computer and a camera and a microphone, right? So uh, we're lucky. Everyone gives a nod to frontline workers and they fully 
deserve that. So whether it's nurses, doctors, hospital workers, etc., I think the the other frontline workers that sometimes get forgotten, and I'd love to give a nod to them right now, to make that happen, you still need bus drivers that, that drive people to and from their shifts. You still need, when you're sitting at home and you're ordering from Uber Eats, guess what? Someone in a restaurant somewhere still cooked that meal. So not everyone was able to work remotely. When you went to the supermarket and you unstocked all of those toilet paper rolls, someone stocked those toilet paper rolls, a truck driver delivered those toilet paper. So, so the, not everyone was lucky enough to be able to uh, do what you and I did with our pivot. Um, and my, my deepest gratitude goes to all of those people that when the pandemic was at its highest, we didn't really know just how big it was going to get and they were putting themselves in harm way to, harm's way to make sure that their cities and their towns still functioned. People displayed incredible courage. You know, we talked about resilience for a few minutes, but let's not skip over and ignore uh, the courage that a lot of people had to show, including a lot of the frontline workers who you were just talking about, uh, particularly in the height of the pandemic, who had no idea, you know, how much in harm's way they might be and for themselves personally, how they might react if in fact they got COVID. Um, you know, they did what they had to do, uh, not only for uh, their employers, but also for their families. Uh, you know, talk about positive things that came out of a negative circumstance. You know, one positive certainly has been watching how courageous people have been to do extraordinarily difficult things during an extraordinarily difficult time, that tells you a lot about the human spirit. And that gives me uh, great hope, not that I hope we have another pandemic, but great hope for you know, other crises and difficult circumstances that we face around the world. People are courageous and people are resilient. And the vast majority of people that I watched in action you know, we're both of those things. Uh, and there is a small minority of people who are neither of those things. And that was disappointing, but they don't represent the, the majority of goodness that I think we saw in the world and are continuing to see. Yeah, spot on, Ian. Yeah, yeah, thank you for saying that. Okay, so we'll get back into the book a little bit more now. So change is happening around us. And I heard from you that you need to be ready for the fact that some things are out of your control. Uh, but it's how you respond to those events that, that really matter. So change is inevitable, how you respond to some of that change. I think that was an important message you left before. I'd like to get into some of the other messages in the book. So there's 25 essays in there from transform, uh, transformational change experts. Were there any common threads that came out? So when you bring all of these experts together, was there anything that popped out as, oh, yeah, this this came up 17 times or this came up multiple times, et cetera. Yeah, yes, there, there, there are quite a, f a few of those, which turned out to be, you know, the secret sauce, if you will, you know, 10 themes. And we, I'm sure we don't have time to go through all of them. But let me pick a couple that uh, did come up, you know, over and over again, even though they were expressed in, in different ways. One of the most important that came up repeatedly was the importance of understanding and defining reality. You know, start with the truth. The situation is what it is. We are where we are. And as we were talking about a few minutes ago, we don't always control what happens to us, but we do have a lot of control over how we respond to it. And it turns out that, you know, in a lot of these essays and uh, interviews that we also did with a number of senior leaders who have a lot of experience in leading transformational change, one of the, the best and worst aspects of leading transformational change is to what degree do you as a person or does your organization have the ability to define and confront reality because that becomes the baseline for whatever action you take. And as it turns out, individual human beings, as well as organizations, have a wide range of ability and interest to uh, understand and accept and define and clarify and then act on reality. 
uh, and the truth. And so a lot of time and energy gets wasted by people denying the data or explaining it away or wishing it away or dismissing it. You know, I think the scientific term for all that is human nature. We tend to prefer facts and data that reinforce our preferred view of the internal or external environment. And so I think a lot of the the stories, the essays, the interviews, my own observation in, in pulling the book together, you know, kept coming back over and over and over again to this important theme of, you know, start with the truth, define and accept reality. So you know the the baseline that you're coming from and trying to to change. Another one uh, in the essays that was very common, even though it was expressed in a variety of different ways, was the importance of and the inevitability of this concept uh, often referred to as VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That, That terminology, the VUCA terminology, I think comes out of the military, it's quite often used and referred to in leading change uh, concepts. However, what was a little unique uh, from my experience uh, as the lead author of the book was not so much the expression of the existence of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It's really more the uh, inevitability of it. So rather than putting a lot of energy into trying to control volatility or change uncertainty to be more certain, for example, which I I think a lot of change-related materials, books and um, templates and consulting advice and other things that you see out there on, on change, there tends to be this mentality of somehow we've got to you know wrap around our arms around it and get better control over it. And not to be too wild about this, but I I would say it's it's almost impossible you know to control it. So uh, anything that you're thinking about as a as a change leader needs to bake into your game plan the expectation and inevitability of the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity of the world and plan for it, plan around it, plan through it, but don't ignore it. Don't attempt to control it. Don't try to diminish it or minimize it. Don't pretend that it's not there. Uh, None of those strategies work. Those are a couple of things that came through over and over and over again uh, in the the essays that were written, as well as a lot of the interviews that were conducted. There's some really powerful stuff there, Ian, and the words that are coming into my mind are a clarity of reality, right? So, And having that environment. I'm going to come to a question about the environment on that in a moment. So the things I'm hearing from you here is to essentially stop listening to what just confirms what you already know to stop looking for things that just confirm a belief that you've already had and really look, really look and scrutinize the reality of the situation that you're in and have the right environment where people can do that. And the acknowledgement that there are some things that are out of your control, that volatility might be something that you cannot control except for your response to it. And that ambiguity, there might be things that you don't know, but acknowledging that you don't know them is better than pretending that you do. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. If I could just build on that example for a, a minute. The forward of the book uh, is written by a, a gentleman by the name of Ron Sugar, who I was fortunate enough to uh, work for twice in my career. He was my the CEO who I worked for when I was the chief HR officer of, of Northrop Grumman. Great leader, great person, uh, and nice enough to write the forward for the book. You know the the way that that he approaches the forward is he talks about the importance of of three things really: truth, talent, and timing. Uh, you know, and the truth is what we're talking about now: the understanding of and defining reality. The talent piece is surrounding yourself with people 
who can help you confront the reality and do something about it. And then the timing aspect of it is move faster than generally feels comfortable to address the issues. Because uh, in most cases, it's one of these situations where, you know, rarely when you talk to people about looking back on some big change that they made, rarely will they say, you know, I went too fast. I wish I had moved more slowly. You know, typically they're, if they have a regret, the regret is that they didn't move quickly enough uh, to get the traction that they needed to really make progress. And, you know, we used to have this expression in Northrop Grumman that I think summarizes this really well, which is we want good news to travel fast and bad news to travel even faster. And, you know, if you have an organizational culture and a mindset as a leader that you want important data to find you, you know, not only the good stuff, but maybe even more importantly, the bad stuff so that you can get your arms around it and understand it early enough to do something about it before it becomes a huge problem. That's a really important organizational mindset and aspect of a culture that will minimize the risk of you getting in trouble or getting surprised by things that come at you that you didn't expect or, or anticipate. So we, we try to cultivate that type of culture. It's obviously not an easy thing to do, but you have to start with the objective of trying to operate that way before you can actually put an aspect of, of that uh, into your culture. So what would be the number one tip on how to create a culture where everyone doesn't shy away from the truth and doesn't shy away from reality? Yeah, I, I think the single most important thing is, is active, regular, ongoing listening. You know, I think in, in leading transformational change, there's a lot of stuff out there that talks about the importance of communication. And of course, that makes sense. However, you know, I think most people, when they think of active, ongoing communication around change, the first place that everybody's mind goes to is telling telling, telling, explaining, explaining, explaining. And that's important. I mean, I think leaders need to do a good job of providing context and explaining to people why there's a need for change and what the environment is around us that you know causes us to need to transform the business. All of those things are important. But when I talk about communication, that's not really what I mean, or at least not first. What I mean first is listen, 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 understand what's working well, understand what's getting in your way. What are the obstacles that our customers are facing? What are the obstacles that we're facing internally? What are your ideas and advice, uh, people in the workforce, for addressing some of those problems and challenges? And the more often you do that in good times and bad, and the less frequently people get killed or fired for telling you the truth about what's actually working well and what's not working well and what the obstacles are, the more you begin to combat successfully this fear and anxiety that I think most people naturally have, which is to you know share bad news and they feel like bad things are going to happen to them if they share bad news. And so I think it all starts with, with active listening and a little bit of what I call uh, seeking the truth, which is you know, going out and soliciting the type of input that if you if you didn't ask the question, you might not get it. You know, I, I'm a firm believer if you if you ask people what's going on, you might have a 51 percent chance of them telling you. If you don't ask, you have pretty much a zero percent chance of people telling you. And so I'd rather have 51 percent odds at finding out the truth than zero percent. There's a few things popping into my mind here, Ian, as I listen to you. And the first one is psychological safety to make sure that people do feel that they can voice their their concerns, voice the truth, uh, voice the positive and negative news without fear of of any kind of retribution or or any form of judgment associated with that. The other thing that's popping into my mind, you mentioned, you know, almost use the word frontline. The closer someone is to the front line, the more chance are that they have great ideas about what we could do in the business that 
are maybe not being heard. So there might be very visionary people in the boardroom, but the people that are out there serving customers every day are seeing firsthand with their own eyes what's working, what's not working. So why not give them a good damn listening to, right? So they're going to have opinions, particularly if they're passionate about the business. So give them that environment. And then to create that culture, you need to reward them when they do speak up. So not not shoot them down, but reward them. Thank you so much for bringing this to us and and really show everyone else that that's the environment that you want. Yeah, really good. All right, unusual question here for you, Ian. What does pizza have to do with leading transformational change? This was something that in pulling the book together, try to paint a picture from something that most people can relate to. So I, I started thinking about uh, you know pizza as, as an analogy. We actually call it a pizza analogy in, in the book. And um, it turns out that there's an awful lot uh, that, that pizza has to do with leading transformational change. So let me give you a little bit of context and history. Uh, it turns out that you know pizza was thought to be invented in 997 AD in Gaeta, Italy. So it's been around for a long time, quite traditional in, in, in many ways. And uh, you might stop and think about, you know, certain things in, you know, almost any industry, almost any organization that uh, are longstanding traditions and things that we love. You know, here we are many years later, uh, pizza has now become a $150 billion global industry. When I first uh, started putting the book together, I mistakenly believe that on a per capita basis, the United States must be the leader in pizza consumption around the world. It turns out I was very wrong. The uh, country that is the leader in per capita pizza consumption is Norway, of all places. And so it's become a pretty, pretty global, ubiquitous sort of industry. But here's the thing. In, in order to remain relevant and competitive, and to respond to a whole wide variety of external pressures and internal challenges uh, as an industry, if you look at a lot of the dimensions of pizza and the industry, they've all been transformed. So think about it in terms of shapes, sizes, toppings, cheeses, crusts, various preparations, the the access outlets from which you can get a pizza, and even the the various secret sauces that people would use to put on a a pizza, you know, all of those have become incredibly diverse, widely distributed, appealing to an incredible amount of different tastes and preferences, depending on who you are and where you are in the world. And one of my favorite quotes that I picked up around this is believe in yourself. If cauliflower can become pizza, you can become anything. And I, I think it turns out, uh, you know, in many ways, I'm, I'm kind of a pizza traditionalist, you know, in terms of uh, the, the crusts that I like and the toppings that I prefer. And the idea of cauliflower crust, frankly, is not something that I find very attractive. But you know, I've got, you know, one daughter-in-law who's gluten-free and two of my sons, uh, you know, ask for pizza without cheese. And uh, another daughter-in-law is a, is a pineapple and arugula, you know, aficionado in terms of putting that on pizza. And I could never imagine putting either arugula or pineapple on a pizza. So everybody has different tastes. The, the connection back to leading transformational change here over and over again that occurred to me was pizza being reimagined, repositioned in order to remain more relevant and to be competitive against all the other food options and restaurant options and delivery options uh, that people now have at their disposal uh, all over the world. And so You know, I'd ask the people who are, you know, listening and watching to think about in their own industry, in their own organization, in their own life, what are the long held traditions that haven't been questioned 
or reimagined or repositioned to think about how we become and remain more relevant when everything around us internally and externally is changing rapidly. Uh, and many of those things we do not control. That's what pizza has to do with leading transformation. Nice one. Lots of good messages there. And, you know, uh, these organizations where people say, oh, that's the way things are done around here and no one can remember why and no one's challenged it, no one's questioned it. All of these things, the diversity, there's, there's so many great messages, things that you can't control, great messages there. Ian, I love that. We're running out of time now, so I'll, I'll just mention to everyone in the audience that we've barely scratched the surface of the depth of Ian's work here. If you get into the book, you'll find in there had contributing authors from the Consortium for Change and other transformational experts in there. There's interviews with those experts. There's interviews with CEOs and other senior leaders around these common themes that we're talking about here about change. There's a list of seven competing priorities or paradoxes that need to be mastered if you're to able to implement change in your organization and all through to these 10 ingredients for successfully leading transformational change of which we barely scratched the surface of two of those today. So I strongly recommend you have a look at Ian's book and, and you're going to learn a lot more than what you've just done from today's uh, interview. So Ian, I'd like to finish off now with our rapid round. We do this with all of our uh, guests. The first question, what's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? That if things take a little bit longer, yet you come up with a better solution in the end, that's always a better choice than moving faster just for the sake of moving faster. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Nice one. What's your favorite book? I think my favorite book is probably, it's a leadership book. I, I love leadership books. Favorite one is called The Leadership Challenge by uh, Jim Kuzis and Barry Posner. All right, very good. And what's your favorite quote? I've always wanted to be somebody, but now I see I should have been more specific. Yeah, good one. I like that as well. A lot there about identity and, and the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Yeah, well done. And finally, how do people get in contact with you, Ian? I'm sure there's going to be people in the audience that are intrigued by the content that we've been through today. How do people get in contact with you and or the Consortium for Change? Yeah, I appreciate it. Actually, we'll start with a one-stop shop related to the book, which will also connect people with me as well. And there's a book site we've set up, a website for the book, I should say, uh, at www.transformationalchangebook.com. Dot com, which is a bit of a one-stop shop for additional background on the book content and the contributing authors and people can order the book at a discount, that sort of thing. But in addition to being on LinkedIn, email always works great for me. Uh, people should feel free to contact me at iziskin, Z-I-S-K-I-N, at exexgroup.com. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ian. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show. I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of our conversation today and I know that the audience will as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights uh, so openly today. Great to be with you, Mick. Thanks for the invitation and uh, look forward to speaking again soon. Today's episode was brought to you by my new book, You're a Leader, Now What?, the Proven Path to High Performance Leadership. The book contains many of the great lessons that we have learned together here on the Leadership Project podcast, together with lessons that I've collected over my 30-year career as a leader. The book is aimed towards first-time leaders, but really there's something in there for everyone. If you would like to show your appreciation for this show, we would greatly appreciate if you were able to go and Get your copy of the book on Amazon as either an ebook or a paperback. And if you could leave us an honest review on Amazon. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Project podcast at mixbeers.com. A big call out to Faris Sadek for his sound design and editing of our audio and video content, and to the whole team at TLP 
Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calipo, Rika Vadanes, and my wonderful supportive wife, Say Spears, who is also our operations manager. This show would simply not be possible without you. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts. You can catch the video podcast and our video of the week at the Leadership Project YouTube channel. And you can join the conversation at the Leadership Project Facebook community group. We look forward to bringing you more great content and interviews next week as we continue to learn together and lead together. In the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.